as you know, we're, we're right on the precipice, right at the, on the verge of Christmas Day, and so we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn your Bibles there, Luke chapter 2, um, and we're going to preach simply a sermon entitled, Peace on Earth, Peace on Earth on earth. Let's, let's begin to read. There's a number of places that we can read this amazing story uh, in the scriptures. Uh, most of the gospels, uh, most of the gospel writers give an account. John doesn't give a, a real deep account of it other than the divinity of Christ. But um, my favorite reading, I think, is from the book of Luke. So that's where we're going to read this morning, Luke chapter 2. And let's just start at verse 8 if you want to follow along with me. It says, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in fields keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Now I know you're familiar with the story, but I want to just break it down just briefly for a few moments today and uh, give you some thoughts from, from what I think when, as I read the story. Number one, as you know, the angel comes and appears to shepherds. Many of our programs and our Christmas pageants and our plays and even our movies typically would depict the shepherds as kind of, kind of somewhat of as an esteemed position. Usually they're dressed fairly well. Um, but let me just tell you right off the bat, that's not the case. That's not the reality. If you do any kind of research, you're, you're, you'll begin to realize quickly that the shepherds were really the people who couldn't find a regular job. They, they were the unemployed. They were, they, were the kind of, they were in a difficult place. They were, many of them were down and outers. Some of them, I don't know about, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but maybe some of them were, you know, had kind of a sordid past. And so now they've been, they've gathered in the fields because let me just ask you, who, who wants to spend all night sitting in a field just watching sheep, right? And so it wasn't this, this glorious position. The likelihood is they, you know, it's just, they're shepherds. Like you've seen true farmers. Like when you see true farmers in our area, they're, they've got some grease on them. They've got some Soybean dust in the air. I mean, then you know they're they're farmers. They're working, and so that typically would have been what the shepherds were like. Um, and and the likelihood is is they're gathered in an area. There's probably a fire. The sheep are with them. Most people don't realize this, but sheep are afraid of the dark, right? And so they weren't out just in the in the fields. They were they were gathered together. They were around the fire most likely. And and we don't know this, but the likelihood is they're they're probably bickering. Because that's typically what we do, isn't it? When we get together with one another, we gather around a coffee table. And, and, and the time of, of the birth of Christ, it was a time very much like ours. It, it was a time where there was a great deal of corruption, right? Uh, an enemy force, an enemy nation has become an occupier in the land of Israel. The Roman Empire is now ruling over the people. And so you know that has to cause a great deal of contention, right? A, a strife, there's, there's taxing. There's rumors of taxing. They're getting ready to set out a tax. How many of you know whenever there's taxes involved, that the people get upset, right? And they're frustrated. They're probably looking at their pay stubs from last week, uh, guarding the sheep, and they're, you know, it's 30%, 50%, 70%. And so no doubt they're discouraged, they're despondent, they're angry, they're frustrated. Um, and, and it's in that environment, it's in, it's, it's in that place where the angel of the Lord appears to them. Now, you know as well as I do, if, if an angel was to appear before us, we would probably have the same reaction. There would be a sense of fear, a sense of awe. Um, but, but I thought about it, and one, it would be because it's a miracle, all right? We don't see angels every day. That's the obvious answer. But, you know, I had to wonder. I, I wonder if they weren't, there wasn't a sense of fear because they begin to look at their lives. You know, when, there's always moments in our lives where we're brought to a place where we've just got to kind of look at ourselves with reality, you know? And it's these moments, sometimes it's in a church service, maybe it's in a time throughout your life where God just kind of brings you to a place where he puts a mirror in front of your life. And, and I don't know about you, but those times come a lot when I'm in the Word or when I'm in a worship service or when I'm in the presence of God, right? It's like you begin to see yourself for who you are. Every encounter of the Bible where, where men have had some uh, uh, engagement with God, with the holiness of God, with the, with the power of God, the natural reaction is to look at ourselves and to think of our sin, 
of our brokenness, of our weakness. You think of Isaiah as he has his encounter in Isaiah chapter 6. His first response is, woe is me. I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and that happens throughout the Bible. And so in some ways, I think that's exactly what's happening with the shepherds. They, they're seeing them. They're, they're, now, they're realizing they're having an encounter with the divine. And, and they're brought to a place, and most likely, this is just my thought, I think, I think they're thinking about their sin, they're thinking about their shame, they're thinking about their guilt. There's probably a moment, an instant of, 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 oh my gosh, what have I done? I wish I would have lived better, I wish I would have gone to more church services, I wish I would have prayed more, you know. And that's the natural tendency for you and I when, we're, when we encounter the holy, when we encounter the divine. We, we begin to immediately look at ourselves, and there's a sense of condemnation, there's a sense of shame, there's a sense of guilt, and, and, and for many of us, for most of us, rightfully so, right? Because when we begin to realize ourselves in light of who God is, it's, it's the natural reaction. We're, we're unclean, we're undone, we're sinners. But I want you to notice what the angel says. The angel immediately stops them in thought. He stops the shame, he stops the condemnation, he stops the guilt in a moment, and he says, in essence, no, I've not come to bring the judgment of God. I've not come to bring the wrath of God, but instead I've come with an amazing message, and this message is a great message of joy for all people. Thanks be to God today. God doesn't want you and I living in shame. You know, I think as we get ready to celebrate Christmas, let's make sure that we understand that. God does not want you living in shame and guilt from your past, from your sin. He, he, wants, you to, he wants to deal with your sin once and for all through the cross of Jesus Christ. He wants you and I to bring it before him in faith and to release it. The Bible clearly teaches us that there is no condemnation for those who have given their hearts fully to Christ. And in many ways, that's what I see the angel doing. You know, he's, he's talking to this ragtag group of men and he's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't fear. You know, because they're probably thinking like you and I think often. God, why don't you, I just deserve judgment. I don't deserve anything more than judgment. I don't deserve anything more than wrath. But he says, no, that's not the message that I've been sent to bring. I've been sent to bring a message of good tidings of great joy to all people. And this morning, that's what Christmas is reminding us, that God's not against you today. God's for you. So much so that the story, this, this message, as we know, is a story of hope. It's a story of joy. It's a story of peace. It really is a story of God himself stepping down out of heaven and coming to the part of creation that he loved the most. The most prized portion of creation, which is you. It's you and I. It's us. It's, he knew we were away. He knew we were scattered. He knew we were like sheep that were without a shepherd. And he came to us. He is Emmanuel, right? God with us. He stepped down out of glory. And he came and chose to come to you and I. And we, we didn't even know we needed rescue. But God saw us and he knew our need. And he chose on his own will, through his own authority, by his own power. It's what grace is. He came on his own. And he split the heavens, he bowed the heavens as it is, and he came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, his son. And so Christmas is about the reminder today that God is for us, God is not against us. I mean, even as we look around today in our culture, you know, nothing's really changed in 2,000 years, folks, if you want to be honest. If you look at the story that's, that's revealed here in the book of Luke and throughout other passages of scripture, nothing's really changed. You know, we're still fighting tax battles, we're still complaining about politics, we're still fragmented and disunified, arguing and bickering. There's still no sense of peace and joy. All of the men throughout history who have risen up among us and said, I'll bring you a joy. I'll bring you a utopian society. I have the answer to life's problems. All of them have come and gone, and none of them truly had the answer. You see, you see God understood as he looks down, as he looked down 2,000 years ago, as he, looked down, as he looks down today. He knows that the greatest need in the human heart is not, is not a political leader, it's not a religious leader, it's not found in man, it's not found in might or strength or power in the natural man, but it's found in a savior. Everything that, human, that man needs, every desire of the human heart is found in a Messiah, in a savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, give him praise for that. And, and, and so that's what the angel is declaring to them. He's saying, God sees all of your need. He sees all of your weakness. He sees all of your brokenness. He knows all about it, but he isn't coming with wrath and judgment. He's coming with a message of great joy. He's coming to earth for you. He's coming to save you. He's not leaving you in your destitute and broken state. He's coming 
to bring salvation. I want you to notice this message of, of great joy, this good tidings of great joy. He says it's for all people. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful because that means me. Like all people means me. I'm included in that. You should think the same because it includes you. Today, this message of hope and peace is for all people. It means every race, every culture, every kindred. It's for the young as well as the old. It's for the rich as well as the poor. It's for the educated as well as the uneducated. It doesn't matter where you are today, what, what your lifestyle is, where you're at in, in terms of your culture and what's going on in your life. Today, Christ came for you, and Christ came for me. This message of hope is for all people. Now, the question that you and I have to ask ourselves as we consider this is, are you experiencing this joy? Because the, the, the angel says it very clearly. He says, this is a message. It's a good message. It's a message of hope. And it's a message that's going to bring great joy to the world. That's why we sing this song, one of our favorites, Joy to the World. But you have to ask yourself this morning, are you truly experiencing this joy? And if you're not, then the next question has to be, why? Why are you today not experiencing the joy that the angel said would be to all men? In other words, it's accessible to everyone. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to have it immediately. It just means that it's going to be accessible. The door is going to be open for all men, all women, all children, all walks of life. There's going to be access to joy now. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of turmoil, there's going to be a pathway of peace and of joy. And, and so you have to ask yourself, you and I have to evaluate our lives and say, am I experiencing this? And if not, why? What is it? What's keeping me from this? Is, am I fully embracing the fullness of what Christmas is? Am I embracing the fullness of what, what took place over 2,000 years ago? Do I appreciate what God has done? Do I, do I appreciate the fact that God stepped out of heaven to seek me out, to seek my family out? Have I, have I embraced this by faith? Or is this nothing more than just another story? Is it just a story that, that you're trying to find hope in, you know? I, I, I told the first group this morning that I'm, I'm just amazed, and one of my pet peeves is how the church has allowed the world and the secularization of Christmas to just creep into the, to the, to the, to the, wall, into the walls of the church. I mean, we have the most amazing story ever given, the most amazing story ever, ever told in all of human history, and we allow this commercialization of this, you know, of Christmas, and we talk about, like, the magic of Christmas and all of this, and we think there's this dust that comes out of a cloud or something. I don't know. And whatever story you're watching, and and they're good, they're fine. I'm I'm I gotta be careful. I I, I don't want to speak against any of your favorite Christmas movies. You know, I know that would put me in a bad position. But 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 can I just tell you that like some of that's not true. You know that you're for some of you for those of you that are lonely this morning. You know it's not you're not gonna walk, and then there's gonna be a field of. Uh, a cedar trees and you know and there's going to be the man in shining armor and he's going to look perfect his teeth are perfectly white you know it's the girl she's got her hair shining listen can i just say it's not real there's no magic to this thing it's not magic it's divine it's not magic it's supernatural and it and it has nothing to do with 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 material things or even even in relationships although relationships are fantastic we've spent three weeks talking about the importance of relationships but at the end of the day what christmas is is god himself coming to rescue a wretched and vile and needy sinning people and god has stepped down in our midst and that's the joy of it all is that we didn't deserve one bit of it we, we, didn't, we didn't do anything to receive it. It's just the grace and love and mercy of God. And you've got to ask yourself this morning, have you embraced Christ? Have you, have you truly, by faith, begin to understand and know what it is that took place on what we celebrate and what we call Christmas? Because it's far more than the commercialization. You know, all of that leaves everyone empty. That's what I'm so amazed about. I, I, I'm amazed, you know, if you look at our culture, it's really quite... Comical. I, I got to think that history will look back and look at us and, and it'll be a co somewhat comical. You know, you, we go through weeks and weeks of buying people gifts that they don't really want. I told Charlotte the other day we were, I, whoever, was the, whoever was the retail guy, the, the mar what a marketing genius. Let's create this game where we pass gifts around to one another and we steal them. We, we'll charge about 20 bucks a piece and we'll buy gifts for people that nobody wants. That nobody likes them anyway, nobody wants them, but we'll feel this pressure, 
and, and we'll, we'll gather around and we'll share these things and, and we'll feel pressure to buy gifts. We'll feel pressure to get our kids the latest toys and all of that. And the only one that's laughing are the people that, that own the businesses and the material. They're laughing all the way to the bank. And you and I are running ourselves ragged, trying to find the best gift. And we know, we just instinctively know, don't we? This is not going to bring a bit of joy. But we feel forced to do it. We follow the rat race, you know. And, and then we do Christmas. And then you're disappointed with the gift you give. You're gift di disappointed in the reaction you get. And, and then after it all, you know, not any of you, but the rest of the world, they, uh, Christmas is over and everybody gets drunk because they're so depressed. That's what New Year's Day is, New Year's Eve. I mean, that's our culture. Think about it. And, and it's like we got this day at the end of the year, like, let's just wipe all of our sorrows away because there's no joy. We thought there was going to be joy in that present, in that tree, in that experience, in that Christmas walk, in that Christmas carol. Somehow, some way I'm going to find peace. I'm going to find joy. This is going to be the year. I'm going to find some kind of Christmas magic. And if you're not trying to find it in Christ and in Christ alone, you will be left empty and at the end of the year, broken and in need and helpless. And that's what our culture does. And then we get up from a drunken stupor as a people and we say, oh, I'm going to do so much better this year. We make New Year's resolutions that we can't keep. Right? And just think of the rat race of it all. But that's, folks, listen, right before us today is the story. It's, it's where true joy and true peace is found. It's been there all along. It's, it's the reality of what God has done for you and I. Now, I want you to notice that he... The angel declares this. He says it's joy and you should feel it. You should experience it. He says there's going to be born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In verse 13, I want to focus on this for a moment. It says suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Now I want to just give you my take on this if I can. It's, it's it's not the, it may not be theologically right. I don't know, but I don't think you know either. And so this, let me just go with me for a moment because this is how I see this. Hey, now think of it. Think of the story. We've got, we've got the shepherds, and we know their backstory. And the sheep are there now, and the angel's here, and, and okay, he's not going to kill us. Uh, we, we got through the first few minutes. Uh, we're we're going to live through this maybe. They're kind of in shock. They're standing there. And all of a sudden, out of the heavens, there's this host of heavenly beings they begin to see heaven they get to they get a small glimpse of heaven and here's how i see it i think what happened is while all this is taking place jesus is now in the manger uh, the angel is declaring the goodness of god the salvation of man peace on earth goodwill toward men and and what happens is the angels have gathered it's not just the angels the bible says it's a heavenly host so so i think i think it's not only the angels it's maybe the prophets of old who had prophesied about this day they're standing over the portals of heaven. One of, them, one of them caught glimpse, you know. They knew something was going on. It's just like you and I today. If there's a lot of cars in the parking lot of your neighbor, you're like you know, like you get on Facebook, something's going on with my neighbors. Something's, you know, whenever there's a buzz, it's, it tends to attract people, doesn't it? And so I think that's what was going on in heaven. I, I think one of the angels caught glimpse. and like, wait a minute, this... What is happening? And, hey, come over here. Check this out. And they're all, and they're leaning over, and they're watching this. They're, they're watching as Jesus is there. Think of this for a moment. The only time the angels have experienced Christ is in his glory. They've seen him in his glory and his wonder and his splendor. They've worshipped around his throne. They've served him for all of eternity past. They know him to be God. And now they look down, and he's in a manger. He's in a barn full of animals. He's, he's taken himself and he's put flesh upon his divinity. He stepped out of the glory and the wonder of heaven and he's sitting in a manger and they're looking out and they're listening to this angel declare everything is going to be okay. He hasn't come to judge you. He hasn't come with wrath, but he's come to save you. And they're listening to this and they can't understand it. You know, the Bible says that the angels don't understand the love and the depth of God's love for you and I. Do you know that? The Bible teaches that, that angels don't understand redemption. They don't know what it's like to be lost. They've never been lost. They never sat in a jail cell like some of you have. They never walked into a crack house as many of you have. They've never been into relationships where you were hurt, where you were betrayed, where you were broken. They've never experienced those things. They've never experienced the weightiness and the brokenness and the hurt and the pain of sin. And so they don't understand what it's like to be lifted out of that place and brought into a place of new life and hope. 
And so they're looking out over all of it, and they're hearing it, and they're trying to take it in. And it's as if they can't take it anymore. They're overwhelmed, and the only thing they can do is begin to rejoice. And they say, glory, 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 glory to God in the highest. Would you see what he's doing? Look what he's done again one more time. God has amazed us with his wonder and his splendor and his mercy and his love. Would you look at this? And it's as if heaven meets earth for just a moment because, because they've, they've slipped over the portals of heaven as they've watched this scene unfold. And they declare glory to God in the highest. You know, I think that, and I think God help us as a people that we could just have a little bit of understanding. I mean, the angels had, at, they don't even know about it. They have an you and I have experienced what they're seeing. Could our reaction not be at least a little bit close to their reaction? Can it, could, could we not show some sense of excitement and joy? Can, can we just begin to realize for a moment and have enough courage to stand in the room and say, you know what, it's not about this man in a suit, it's not about this story, it's not about presence, it's not about materialism, it's about peace on earth because God Almighty has come to us. God is with us, he's for us, he's not against us, there's salvation. I don't have to live in my shame and my regret and my sin anymore. I can be free. I can be free. And they, they got some glimpse of it. And they look down and they're just shocked. That's how I see it. You know, they, they, can't, they can't go any further. They're just like, man, I can't take this. And it's like they get caught, you know, get caught watching all of this. Declaring glory to God. Glory to God. You know, they're looking down. And I think what they're so amazed by is, why would God go to them? Remember, he, the, God doesn't talk to the, you know, we think that somehow God sits in heaven and he tells, God doesn't, God doesn't have a counselor. You understand that? The scripture says, who is a counselor unto God? No one's a counselor. God doesn't s check with the angels first before he does something. The angels just kind of got to watch this. You know, they, they just observe, they just honor and glory and give praise to whatever he does. And, and so now they're watching and they're seeing God. They're seeing Christ. And, and he's in such a meek and such a humble state. And, and they've got to be thinking, why? Why is he doing this? Why is he going to the very people who reject him? Why are they going to the very people who continually disobey him? Why, why, why is he going now? And walking among the very people who forget him days on end. Okay, now, do you see for a moment why they were declaring glory to God in the highest? Well, why, why is God in his holiness, in his purity, in his right? Why is he going and engaging with people who live such vile, sinful, wretched ways? You understand that's what happened on Christmas morning, right? That God stepped down. Now, why do you think the story tells us it's, the, the barn is really just a type? It, yes, it was literal, but, but it was also a type. It was, the, it was a dirty place. It, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a clean place. It wasn't a palace. It, it wasn't an amazing hospital that was sterilized and clean. No, he's stepping right into the sinfulness of man. The angels are looking at this and thinking, these people are vile. Why would he walk among them? Look at the way they treat one another. Look at the way they act. They serve false gods. They run to everything that pleases them, any kind of pleasure. They create pleasure under the sun. They only turn to God when they need something. And here God is in a meek and mild manger coming to the very people who despise him. And they just, they just, they can't comprehend it. And so I think the prophets were there. They were a part of the multitude, the heavenly host. It says heavenly host. And I think they're there and they're starting to say, wait a minute. This is what he meant. Th this, is, this is what he said. This is what he spoke through me thousands of years ago. It's, it's coming to pass. And as they look down, they just can't help themselves. Glory to God. Glory to God. They're overwhelmed. I don't know about you, but I think if the angels and the heavenly host are overwhelmed, Christmas of all times should be a season that overwhelms us. And praise be to God should come from our hearts. God, thank you. What an amazing reality that you have done in each of our lives. But not only do they declare glory to God,
But they say something. They, they really are speaking something that's prophetic. And they say, on earth is peace now. You see, they have a, they have a bird's eye view. They, they see the chaos. They see the confusion of our sin and our brokenness and the shame of it all. And all of this just degradation and confusion that's on the earth. And, and what they're declaring is, the, these people may not realize it, but God is going to bring peace to them. They're at odds with God, but God's about to bring peace with them. And so they declare peace on earth. And that's what I want to focus on just for the next few moments. Because if you know anything this morning about Christmas, and if you experience anything this year, I pray that you will know and understand today that Jesus Christ has come to bring peace. Jesus Christ has come to bring peace to each and every one of us today. In fact, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah, speaking of this child that was going to be born, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he said, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who Jesus Christ is. He is the Prince of Peace. And this literally means Isaiah was prophesying that the reign and the rule of the, of the Messiah would be characterized by many, many things. But the thing that would characterize the coming Messiah would be that of peace. And the Hebrew word and the Hebrew uh, uh, character of this all is the word shalom. And you've probably heard it, right? You've probably heard that, that greeting, shalom. It's a, it's a Jewish greeting now. Many people, if you, if you talk to someone who's Jewish, they'll say shalom. It's a hello and a goodbye. But there's really great depth into what it means. In fact, shalom, it's, it's a Hebrew concept of peace, and it means this. It's, it's bigger than, just like many Hebrew words, you know, we have love, and then there's four different words for love in the Greek, and all the languages are different, of course. And for the Hebrews, shalom was not just, it wasn't just peace in and of itself, it was, it was a wholeness, right? Shalom, really, if I could just, I think that's the simplest way for me to understand, it's just, it's wholeness. In other words, today... What the Christmas story speaks to you and I is God wants you to be whole. I want you to understand that today. We're not going to take much longer, so I, I want you to ponder it. The story of Jesus Christ coming to earth reveals to us and shows us the heart and nature of God, that God wants each and every one of you to be whole. Whole in your spirit, whole in your body, whole in your mind, Hole in your emotions. He, he doesn't want any part of you to be broken. That's why Jesus, when he started his ministry, he declared this. He said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says this. Satan, the enemy, has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. It's, it speaks of fragmenting, destruction, right? A lack of peace. He said, but I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. In other words, I want to take the fragmented pieces, the broken pieces... That have caused because of sin. And I'm going to come and over a journey as you walk with me. As you learn of me. As you grow in my understanding. As you understand the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And as it progresses you will see that I'm going to begin to take the broken pieces. That, that either you or other people around you have broken. And I'm going to begin to take them and bring them together. And I'm going to restore you. I'm going to redeem that which was lost. That which was broken. That which everyone around you thought there was no hope for. I'm going to come. And when I do, I'm going to, I'm going to do such a work that I will begin to bring restoration and healing and wholeness. You see, there's so many Christians today that are living and they're saved. And they know they're saved, but they're not happy. They're not, there's no joy. There's no peace. You, yes, you've confessed faith, you've, you know, you did everything you had to do so you know you won't go to hell, but, but my question this morning is, are you experiencing the shalom of God? The full peace, the, the completeness. It's, it's, the literal meaning is wholeness, completeness, soundness. It entails health. It talks about safety, and it entails prosperity. And it carries with it, I love this, it carries with it the implication of permanence. In other words, it's, it's not circumstantial. For some today, if you're here and you're worried about your health, uh, the idea of peace is, I just want to get a good report from the doctor. If you're here today and, and your struggle, your uneasiness, your unsettledness is from finances, you, you're just thinking, if I could just get through this financial storm, and then I'll have peace. If, if it's something of emotional background, something that's happening, you think, 
if I can just forgive this person, then I'll have peace. But I want to tell you something. Those are all fleeting. Those are all, those are all circumstantially based. Because I'm, I'm, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer in the room, but can I just tell you this? You, all of those things can come to pass, and you'll enjoy a moment of peace. But if you're, not, if you're not rooted and grounded in the shalom of God, it's, if in other words, if you're not finding your peace through Christ and through a relationship with Christ in covenant, then, then you're just going to have a moment of peace, but that's not God's desire for you. God wants you to walk in peace. He wants you to experience peace. He wants you to live in peace. And he doesn't want you to just experience for a moment. He wants you to experience for on all of time and then, of course, all of eternity. That's what shalom really literally begins to translate to. That's why in John the third letter that John writes, the third epistle, John, uh, the three, third John and the second verse, he, he opens it up by saying this, I pray that you prosper in all things. I, I pray, is it up there? I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I want you to notice that everything's entailed here. Obviously, it's all entailed by the word all things. This is the shalom of God. He says, I want you to have the shalom of God in every area. I don't want you to lack in anything. That's what Paul goes on to tell Timothy later on or in another letter. He says, Timothy, I don't want you lacking in any area. I want you to be strong mentally. I want you to be strong in your physical body. I want you to be strong in your spirit, man. I want you to be strong financially. I, I just, I want you to walk in the shalom and the peace and the power of God. He says, I want you to prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There's a great teaching here that we could get into at some other time, but, but quickly, I, I, really what, it says is, is what, what it's saying is there should be a balance in our life, is, is as you're growing and maturing and your understanding of who Christ is and in his word, then guess what? It should, it should, you should be prospering and, and growing and maturing and developing in fruit in areas in that area, but then while that's happening, you're learning about the physical as well, and you're growing in those areas also. It's, we learn that our physical bodies are temples, and so we learn to take care of them. We learn, we, we learn to eat better and to exercise because we know that our bodies are a temple of God given to us by God and that we're called to be stewards over it. It's, it's learning that our finances really don't belong to us, and after all, they're, they're just resources that have been put in our hands by God, and we're just stewards, and we learn to steward well. And let me just tell you, when you learn to, when you learn to control and steward your health, and you learn to control and steward your, your wealth and your finances, as well as your spiritual life, you will experience peace. You will experience joy. This is not some fleeting concept, you know, some pie in the sky. I'm not some strange guy coming out, uh, you know, in the middle of the night saying, and now let me give you 10 steps. To... No, listen to me. This is clearly revealed in the word of God. This is why Christ has come. He wants you to experience this shalom, this balance, peace, this rest that begins to come from God. Now, the criteria for shalom is, is simply in God. There's, there's nothing else deeper to it than that, folks. It, it rests with God because God himself is Jehovah Shalom. Now, we've used that term, and sometimes some will say that's a, that's a name of God. It's really not a name of God. The, the phrase Jehovah Shalom, actually, it's a phrase, and it means the Lord is peace. It's an ascription. We ascribe to God that he is the Lord of peace. He, just, just like we say God is love, but the reality is that's it. That's, God is love. God doesn't love. He is love. It's, it's, it, we say that he loves and he's loving, and that's true, but the reality is he's love. He's the, very, he's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. He is love. We don't know love without God. And the truth is, today, the same is true with peace. You cannot know peace apart from God. You can't. Because he is, the, he is peace. And if we try to do our life in any direction, in any area of our life, if we try, you know, that's why it's such a foolish concept to try to just be, you know, religion to just be like one part of your portfolio in life. I mean, I know of people like that. You know, their business, they got finance, they got all this education, and then, you know, and I got my little, I got my little part of, of religion too because that's important and that makes up who I am. No, that's foolish. Because God's not willing to take one part. He's not willing to take your one-fifth or one-sixth or whatever it is of your life. And you, and you can't do that with the Lord. It's like you've got to embrace God for all that he is. And when you do, you have peace because you have God. That's what shalom it is. It rests in Christ alone. So we can't experience this peace apart from a saving relationship of Jesus Christ. And on that Christmas morning, that we call it Christmas morning, 
That is exactly what was in the manger that day. You do know that. It it wasn't just an ordinary baby. In, In that manger was the shalom of God. The fullness of God. The completeness of God. Right? The soundness of God. Everything that man needs for health and body and mind and soul and spirit. It was all wrapped up in that swaddling cloth. I mean, can you imagine what a gift? It was all wrapped there in that day, in that particular moment in history where Jesus Christ was, was coming to the earth. And what's amazing is all of it's there. It's, it's everything that, man's, that man needed. That's why the angels are like, you don't even know it, but everything you need is in the manger. Wake up! <laughs> That's my version again, right? That's just my interpretation. That's not... It may not theologically right, but whatever. But then they're like, look, you guys are a mess. And look, it's right there. Just go to the manger. He's wrapped it all up. He's made it easy. He's made it simple. The complexity of God, the uniqueness of God, the glory and the wonder of God that we can't even comprehend even though we've been in his presence for millenniums and millenniums and millenniums. We still can't fully understand him. And there he is in a manger wrapped in cloth and he's there and he's come for you to give you everything you need. Body, mind, soul, spirit, all of it's there. And that's the uniqueness of the story. It's the beauty of the story, but it's also the uniqueness of the story. Because here is the greatest gift ever given to the world. Peace and joy and hope and wholeness and completeness, prosperity, health, salvation, all of it. But he's all in this swaddling cloth, strips of clothing, and he's in an animal manger in a little town that no one knows about. Now to me, as we get ready to close, I think this speaks of something of how you and I receive peace. Because... Paul says that the foolishness of preaching, he refers to preaching of the cross as foolishness. And in reality, it's this, the whole story of Christ. It's, it's from Christmas to Easter. It's not just the cross. It's the story. And, and, and for the intellectual mind like you and I have, it's, it's hard to fathom. It sounds good, and it makes for a good movie, and it makes for a good sermon. But, but at some point, you and I have to go beyond that, and we have to embrace this as this is, this is it. This is my only hope. Like, I'm putting all of my eggs in one basket. I'm, I'm betting my whole eternity on this, on this story. Right? Isn't that true? You've got to come to a place where you just say, this isn't just a story. This is reality. And, and the only way you and I are going to be able to do that is to humble ourselves. Just as it would have been in that day. Now, we read these stories and we, we talk about these kings and all of this. But, but can I tell you the reality is? The real kings of the day, they weren't going to come to a manger. They were not coming to a manger, folks. They sent representatives, they sent, they sent people to seek, they were, they were inquisitive, but they were never going to come out of their royal courts and their priestly garments. They weren't going to come. The religious leaders weren't coming. Now, isn't it strange that no, there, was no, there was no high priest there? There was no religious man? Don't you think? Don't you think? Like, if you think of it, like, just the high priest, you know, the man of God of that time, the, the guy leading the temple. And he hears this news that it begins to get spread abroad. Don't you think the religious would have come? But, but if you read the story, no religious people were there. Why? Because they were full of pride. And, and so I love this because I think Mary got a glimpse of this whole concept in her, in, in, as Christ comes to her, as the angel Gabriel comes to her and reveals that she's going to bear the Christ child, the Messiah. Um, you can read it in the first chapter. But he says, uh, Gabriel says, don't be afraid, Mary. For you found favor with God, and behold, you're going to conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how? Like, that's a fair question, wouldn't you think? She knows better than anyone else. She's a virgin. She knows it. It's not hearsay. It's not gossip. She knows it. And here the angel is declaring that that, that God is going to put inside of your womb his own son. And you're going to conceive him. And she's going, how can this be? Are you kidding me? And and the angel answers and says, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. 
And as she's pondering this and she's wondering, she says, don't, don't worry. Don't wonder, Mary, about this. Don't give too much thought because you'll never figure it out with the natural mind. But rest assured in this truth, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Don't try to figure it all out. And listen to me today. If you're listening by internet or if you're listening here in this room, you will never experience the joy and the fullness of salvation if you're not willing to simply let aside and set aside your intellect, your own strength, your own ability, your own wisdom, your own power, and simply come by faith as a child and say, I know that this is real. Jesus Christ came to the earth and he died for my sins and I shall receive him as Lord and Savior over my life. It's the only way. And, and, and just as it's the only way to experience salvation, it's the only way to experience the shalom of God, the peace of God, the fullness, this full peace of God. And she goes on and she says this. She, she goes and visits Elizabeth, of course, and they have their little gathering, and John Baptist sleeps in the womb, and she starts to sing a song, and it's called the Magnificent, the Magnificent, right? That's, I couldn't think of it this morning, but that's the song of Mary. It's just her praise, like, whew, can you believe this? Like, I don't even understand it all, but I know it's true. I'm starting to get this bump in my stomach. It's got, I know it's real. And, and she sings, and she declares, great is the Lord. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God. But I want you to notice what she says. She says, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. I, I don't think she knew fully what she was saying. She's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but she's preaching the gospel. How? She's preaching the gospel because she's declaring that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. She's preaching and declaring that unless you and I are willing to come, just as Jesus taught as he gets older, unless you're willing to come as a child, you'll never receive the kingdom of God. In other words, you, it's, you just got to believe by faith. You, you got to know that you're lost. You got to know that you're broken. When, when she talks about the rich, she's really probably, in some ways, she probably is referring to the natural rich, but there's a spiritual application here. She's speaking about those who, in their own hearts, feel like they're good enough. You know, they're good enough. I don't need Christ. I'm good enough, you know. I don't, I don't do a lot of wrong. Uh, I don't hurt many people. I go to work every day. I make a good paycheck. I only drink a few beers a night. Whatever. I'm a good guy. I don't beat my kids. I don't kick my dog. I feed it. All this. I got a good life. Can I just tell you, sir, ma'am, if that's who you are and you don't think you have need of Christ, this, Mary is speaking about you. She's saying of you. If you believe that you're rich, if you believe that you're all that you have need, that you're, that you're sustaining your own self and you have no need of Christ, then you will never receive what it is that God has come to give you. The peace and the joy and the salvation of Christ. You will get sent away empty. You will be sent away empty today. If you're not willing to humble yourself and bend your knee to the authority and power of Jesus Christ. That he is the only door and the only way to the Father. There is no way of salvation except through Jesus Christ. You and I have to be willing to embrace that. And that's, that's a humbling of ourselves. Jesus taught this concept so clearly in Matthew in the fifth chapter when he teaches what we call the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you understand? It's the poor in spirit that receive the kingdom of God. It's, it's when you and I understand we don't deserve any of this. We're all recipients of goodness and mercy and grace. And, and, and we, we understand that we need it. Think of the indictment that Christ gives to the church in the book of Revelation. The Laodicean church, when he looks, and he says, listen, man, you've got it all messed up. You look at yourself, you see your resources, you see your, your wisdom, your teaching, your abilities, and you say of yourselves, you're rich, you're increased with good, you have need of nothing, but I see the real you, I see behind the mask, I see behind it all. It's all a facade. The reality is you are poor and wretched and blind and naked. And God help us that we're willing to see our own poor spirit and our own brokenness our own nakedness, because he goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn. And he's not necessarily talking about bereavement here. He's talking about a willingness to look at our own selves and say, I'm a mess, man. I need God. For they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For it's those, it's that man, it's that woman, it's that child that will be full. That's what Mary was declaring before Jesus Christ ever began to walk the earth. And I think it was Christ speaking out of her through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to come as a child and embrace this story. You won't ever fully embrace, understand it. You can't. That I, there's, it's like it's ridiculous to the natural mind. Is it not? But it's by faith that you and I are saved. It's by faith that we trust and know that this is reality. As they come and sing, I know it's hard for many of us to just embrace it because the typical reaction for all of us or for most of us is we, we tend to not see beyond or bigger than our own life experience, right? In other words, that's, that's kind of how we create what we call a worldview. Our world, we've talked about this before, but our worldview is based on our experiences. So, um, you know, whatever your experiences in life have been, that's kind of to the level of where you are. And, and some of you have seen things and you say, man, that was God and that was, that was a divine moment and that was supernatural. So maybe your propensity is to think more about supernatural things and you embrace it. But some of you are just like, man, you're black and white and your brain is wired that way and whatever. And so if you're not careful, that's, that's just it. You, you will never be able, if you're not careful, to see beyond or bigger than your own life experience. And so the sad reality of that is we then limit or diminish the possibility that everything we're reading is actually a personal story just for you and that today God wants to save you, set you free, empower you, fill you with joy, give you his peace, and put hope in your heart. It's for you. It's not someone else. It's not another group. It's not that's their thing and this is my thing. That's, it's you. It's for you today. Don't let your limited life experiences diminish the reality of what God's word has spoken and declared. Let's stand all over the building today.